now we're moving on to our simultaneous panels. And for you who were here yesterday, you know that this is a moment where we need to use our headsets. Now for the new people in the crowd, if you do not have a headset, you have to go outside, unfortunately, and take one and then come back with it. So if you do not have a headset, please go outside and get your headset and then come back because you will need it for these simultaneous panels. Today, we pushed it through because yesterday we had two panels and now we're doing three panels at the same time. Why not? So I will just introduce to you the first panel, Frontiers in Health and Biotechnology. So continuing on the biotech discussion, if you are interested to hear more, I invite uh, the moderator, Dimitrios Fotiadis, Professor of Biomedical Engineering at University of Ioannina, as well as the speakers to please come on stage. And this will be... Channel one. So this is panel one and channel one. I invite the speakers on stage. Welcome. Let's give them a round of applause, please. And for, for our second panel, which will be on MIT's open learning. So really how open learning builds the future of education. I invite uh, Ms. Anna, uh, Anjali Sastri, who was here earlier to uh, talk about the smart partnership. And she leads the Jamil World Education Lab and is also associate dean for the open learning at MIT. Welcome to her and her speakers. And this is panel two, channel two. So if you want to hear about open learning, please tune in at channel two. And for the last panel, Deep Tech and Entrepreneurs and Investors, all about Deep Tech and de-risking, I will be inviting the moderator, Marina Hatsopoulos, who is an entrepreneur and writer, as well as board chair at Levitrock Technologies and her speakers. And this is Channel 3, so please tune in for Channel 3. Uh, I think that uh, we can start. Uh, this is the biotechnology panel. Uh, having four experts, uh, and uh, today we'll discuss about biotechnology, the challenges, we'll see the emerging technologies around biotechnology, and then we'll discuss about the current state of biotechnology, and also to see the insights into the future in this rapid evolving field. Uh, so today's deep discussion with four experts in biotechnology, and uh, those are Professor Nectarius Tavernaraitis, uh, then we have Dr. Sloan Alibis Phillips from uh, USA. We have Dr. Stelios Papadopoulos. And also we have Brian uh, Anthony, uh, Professor Brian Anthony from MIT. Uh, so uh, we'd like to discuss all those things about technology to see how those people have reached the area of biotechnology, to discuss what are the current challenges and to see what are the opportunities and to see several other things. So we'll start from a short introduction from each one of you. Just a few words, Natalia, about you. Who are you and what you're doing? I'm, I'm a professor of uh, uh, molecular systems biology at the medical school of the, the University of Crete. I'm also serving uh, as uh, the chairman of the board of directors of uh, the Foundation for Research and Technology, which is the largest research institution of, of Greece, uh, running 10 institutes throughout the country. And uh, I... Personally, have a training in cell biology and uh, neuro neuroscience. Thank you, Nectar. Hello. Hi, it's great to be here today. I have a background in public health, and I currently work at a startup called Iterative Health. We were founded out of MIT about five years ago. Um, a few classmates came together, and we were able to grow a company from about five people to now 200. Our focus is on bringing artificial intelligence to the gastroenterology suite and I lead the data operations group at Iterative Health. Yeah, thank you very much. Tell you. you are... I guess my um, claim to fame is that I've been around longer than most. I left my academic uh, position at uh, New York University Medical Center, the cell biology department in the early 80s. I moved to Wall Street. I was uh, one of the earliest biotech stock analysts, an investment banker, I started a number of companies. I uh, served as an executive board member, chairman of many companies, uh, advise, have advised, will advise companies, and I you know, continue to look for innovation in the space. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, so I'm the director of technical operations for MIT's Center for Human Subjects Research, the Center for Clinical and Translational Research. I'm faculty in mechanical engineering and in IMES. Um, but my focus is largely on sensors, uh, medical sensors, uh, particularly in the bio space. Um, 
And also, I have another hat at MIT. I'm the Associate Director of MIT Nano, which is our fabrication facility that allows us to fabricate sensors, uh, and then in collaboration with the CCTR, the Center for Clinical and Translational Research, enable uh, investigators at MIT and external partners to evaluate technology on humans. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, since, okay, we are planning to start the discussion on biotechnology, and before going to that, I would like uh, each one of you Give a little bit more details about what you're doing in your lab, Brian. Let's start from you. I mean, some examples, what you're doing, what are the projects? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Um, I think two areas that I'll touch on that are quite exciting, both broadly and that have a lot of uh, sort of industry sponsorship as well at MIT. Uh, one area is what I'll call ambient sensing. So there's a lot of uh, interest in the use of wearable technology, the, the Fitbits, the Apples, the Garmin's of the world, uh, to monitor physiological signs, physiological signals, and get that information in the context of daily living. Uh, one of the challenges uh, is compliance, having people remember to wear their device. And so we have an uh, interesting collaboration with a company in Japan, Sixui House, one of the largest home builders in Asia, um, to think about how you embed technology into the home, to make the home a smart sensing place, so embedding radar sensors into the walls and ceilings to be able to track heart rate and respiration rate, and selling accelerometers into the floor to be able to extract in the context of daily living uh, information about gait, how you walk around and move around. And so turning your environment uh, into a sort of a smarter place to help provide the wellness information that I think many of us now recognize is important for, for overall wellness in healthcare. Thank you, Brian, for that. Just tell you maybe about Biogen, sure. I don't know. Well, uh... I'm rather narrow. I mean, my interests are exclusively in the area of innovation in pharmaceuticals, and I've been involved with companies virtually continuously that are discovering, developing, and commercializing new drugs. Uh, I'm equally intrigued by scientific discoveries as I am by commercial sales, so long as it relates to drugs. And I, I guess the subject of greater contemporary interest is my involvement. I'm the chairman of Biogen, which is... Uh, somewhat controversial nowadays, uh, but I think at the same time, one needs to appreciate that uh, we brought two years ago a first Alzheimer's drug to market in a very long time, and this uh, past couple of months, a second one, we just announced two days ago, yet another project using an antisense oligonucleotide to remove another significant protein implicated in Alzheimer's in the brain of patients. So. Clearly, the Alzheimer's space and broadly neurology, as well as oncology, are great interest to me. Thank you, Stelio, for that. Uh, yes, Lon, a little bit more detail. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, Iterative Health, as I mentioned, we're really focused on artificial intelligence technology in the space of gastroenterology. The first product that we brought to market was developed to help find polyps during colorectal cancer screenings um, for folks who... Many of the young folks in this room, maybe you haven't had the chance to have a colonoscopy, but um, it's a, typically a procedure that you would like to make sure is done very comprehensively because you don't want to perform them unnecessarily. And we found during, in, the, in the literature that there were up to 26% of polyps being missed during these colorectal cancer screenings. So our first product was to identify these polyps. And um, I had the privilege of being able to help develop that, go through the clinical trial process, go through the FDA, and we're now partnering with, uh, with a group in the, in the GI space to bring that product to market. And then um, we've recently begun to develop partnerships with pharmaceutical companies to figure out how AI can help bring drugs to market more effectively um, with our focus on inflammatory bowel disease specifically. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, thank you. Next area. So I come from uh, the basic research side of the value chain that uh, leads to biotechnological applications. In our lab, we are studying age-related uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, one of the cases uh, that we are focusing on is Alzheimer's disease. We are uh, aiming to understand the molecular mechanisms underlying such uh, uh, pathologies, uh, mostly focusing on, on how uh, our neurons die, uh, how we lose neurons in Parkinson's disease, for example, in Alzheimer's disease and other uh, dementias. And uh, more generally, uh, on uh, the links between these uh, neurodegenerative diseases and aging, because the major risk factor of these diseases is actually old age. Yes. So we, we want to decipher the molecular link. What is it that makes these diseases associated with aging? 
and whether or not then we can break this link so that we can have aging free of uh, disease and pathology. Of course, it's a long way from basic research to applications and uh, eventually uh, uh, spin outs, uh, companies uh, and uh, entrepreneurship. But I think it's, uh, uh, it's uh, basic research is essentially the, bed the bedrock, the, the, uh, the raw material that will eventually lead to important applications. So it's, I think, uh, very important to not forget that and uh, also focus on uh, basic research as well. Okay. How did you start doing that uh, work, uh, Nectari? What was the trigger to go to this area? I mean, uh, talking about a little bit about your career, how, what attracted your readers to go to neurogenerative diseases? When I finished my PhD, I did my PhD in molecular genetics. So I, I had the tools. I, I learned about using molecular genetics tools to address uh, questions. Uh, and I was looking for a field that wouldn't be saturated, that uh, would be open uh, to new inquiry. There would be uh, questions coming, uh, important questions to be addressed. So neurobiology is, was uh, such a field at the time and is still uh, actually one of the uh, major uh, challenges that we are facing as scientists, understanding the brain and understanding uh, the mechanisms and the workings of the brain. Uh, so uh, I decided to go into that area. I initially focused on uh, uh, necrotic cell death, which is a type of cell death that um, is, is seen, is observed uh, in neurodegenerative conditions. And it's a, a relatively unexplored type of cell death. We don't really know how uh, neurons die by this, uh, by this type of cell death. So that was uh, the initial entry point. And then, of course, we uh, deviate in the, into other directions including neurodegenerative diseases and uh, okay. aging itself. Okay. Uh, yeah, very interesting. You were part of the founding team of uh, the Coban UT. Yes. But how did you arrive there, I mean? Oh, that's uh, a good question. Um, so, gastroenterology was not something that I was passionate about as, as a teenager, for example. Um, I, <laughs> I don't I, want to be <laughs> right? You'd be worried about me if I were. Um, I think the first time I learned about you know gastroenterology was my father had to get his first colonoscopy. Um, I my like I mentioned my background is in public health, very interested in healthcare education, access to access to basic basic human rights of, of, of healthcare, right? And at the end of the day, I was very focused initially on um, nonprofit healthcare, bringing basic um, basic access to like reproductive healthcare in particular. And I went to MIT thinking about building on my public health background to bring some more of the technology that I know helps make everything more scalable. Um, but I didn't have a strong focus other than, you know, reproductive health care. And I decided I needed to branch out a little bit. <laughs> but um, I met my, my colleague and our CEO, John, who was very excited about gastroenterology. And he convinced me that the scale of the problem, you know, you've got 20 million colonoscopies performed a year in the United States alone. And again, that impact of actually making sure you've got appropriate detection of disease Polarity cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer-related deaths worldwide. That all, to me, is part of what made me decide that iterative health and the gastro space was going to be exciting. Another part was just the fact that it was a new, it was a new place to explore. I, I, I think, like all of us on the stage here, enjoy learning new things, and it was a chance for me to take some of my basic knowledge, expand it in a new area, and... I've watched a lot of colonoscopy videos, but I've also learned a lot, <laughs> um, and I, 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 I hope to spend another five years in this space. But you haven't had one yet, right? I haven't had one yet. You cook some juice at the end. Brian, you are a mechanical engineer, and uh, you arrived to another area. How this happened? Uh, it's an interesting journey. So I'm a mechanical engineer, computer scientist. Um, I got my start uh, in government research. I worked at Los Alamos National Labs. And uh, as a graduate student at MIT, I started a design company that I sold, and then a uh, product company specializing in high-speed video. Uh, sold that and then came back to MIT. Um, and one of the things that I did was look at, you know, I had a, an advisor once that said, at some point in your life, you're either going to care about water, healthcare, or the environment. Take your pick. When you get old, you're going to care about one of those things. So I picked healthcare. <laughs> Um, but really looking at the historical strength of MIT's collaboration with the semiconductor industry and the opportunity to inv invigorate and connect with medtech. And so this is 15 years ago. 
we started the Medical Electronics Device Realization Center, trying to bring together the companies like TI and analog devices, the semiconductor companies of the world, with the, the historical med tech, so GE and the Philips, and recognizing the opportunity to miniaturize and have the impact the way that semiconductor has uh, throughout its era um, in imaging, uh, in, in personal health, and also in, in pharma. You know, it's one of the opportunities, I, I think, as well, just to connect to pharma is you know, looking at the, the devices that you can get to accelerate clinical trials and get data and information from the, the human sort of in the context of daily living instead of always having to get people enrolled in trials to the hospital or to the clinic. Um, but that's sort of the, the circuitous journey that, that led to sort of a focus in, in, in medical devices and imaging broadly. Yes. Tell you, you have a very long experience in that field. How did you start? What did you have done? What was the path that you followed? I think the starting is interesting. I was a scientist in the lab. And uh, this is a true story. Uh, in October of 1980, uh, Genentech, or like the poster child of the biotech industry, had its initial public offering. For those of you who may not know the term, it's the event through which companies sell stock ownership for the first time to the public. And I walked in the lab and I saw a bunch of my colleagues around the bulletin board looking at a little clipping from the newspaper in a very animated fashion talking about it. And... Um, we all know that scientists don't get excited about much more than their own work. Sometimes work that may contradict what they're doing, and then they get even more excited. So I thought this probably was something extremely important, and I wanted to do something more than laboratory science. The idea of spending the rest of my life in a cold room or in a park and pipetting my life away was not exciting. <laughs> so I thought, what can I do that's still science-related, but you know, more exciting, more far-reaching. And I said, ah, if this is as exciting as these people think, this will be big. And when that becomes the case, there'll be a need for people to interpret science to the business people and business principles to the scientists. And maybe I could do that. And then 10 minutes later, I said, but okay, I have a PhD. So I can prove that I talk science. How do I prove I can talk business? And I thought another 10 minutes, I said, well, i got to go to business school. So I went to business school at night and got an MBA in finance. So now I could talk the talk both ways, except nobody wanted to hear it because it was way <laughs> early and there wasn't a real interest in what I had to offer. But slowly it got to be. And I started talking about biotech and explaining what it was and what it would take to develop drugs and to succeed and make money for investors and one thing led to another, and I always said so like an eye in trying to figure out what comes down next. And literally, you know, to the point uh, Nectarius made, in the, light, in, the, in the late 1980s, I thought, again, way early, the time had come for neurology. I thought it was prime time. So I became involved with a company that doesn't exist anymore that was maybe the pioneer in the Alzheimer's space. And in those days... You know, the prevailing wisdom was there is a protein called amyloid precursor protein, which gets cleaved by an enzyme called beta secretase and generates this amyloid beta that many people thought still think and many don't think it's an important part of the Alzheimer's process. So I became involved with that company and one thing led to another. And, you know, 35 years later, we're still trying to find out a good way to deal with Alzheimer's. And there's many other things along the way. I, well, I don't want to monopolize this conversation, but it's really almost a random walk. You go from one thing to the other. If you're open-minded, if you're curious, you focus on it, you learn from it, move someplace else. So long as, in my case, the focus is drugs. That's all I care about. Okay. Yeah, I see that uh, starting from uh, the sensors for the environment, neurology, in your case, gastro things, in your case, Alzheimer's, we see that we're discussing all about the aging side uh, mm -hmm. here. Is that where the opportunities and challenges in biotech are today? In the aging society, or we should look to other ages? What is your feeling? Uh... Well, there is uh, indeed uh, an issue that is developing. We have a demographic problem, especially in the Western uh, societies, in the Western world. 
the population is aging. Here in Europe, uh, it's actually becoming quite evident, and uh, that is making it into a priority for governments throughout Europe to address the demographic problem. There is an aging population. That means um, exacerbation of the uh, age-related diseases. Uh, this is uh, putting a lot of strain in healthcare systems across Europe. And of course, um, it is a challenge that will become only bigger in the, for, in the future. So this is something that needs to be addressed. And uh, I think that um, uh, now it makes a lot of sense to actually study this, this phenomena. Aging is, um, uh, apart from being an interesting biological phenomenon, is also something that relates to uh, healthcare, the real economy, and the well-being of people, uh, uh, of the society. So. Uh, a lot, of, I think, needs to be invested uh, in uh, the efforts to understand aging and then also understand uh, age-related associated uh, disorders, uh, such as Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, I think this is going to become the next big challenge. Actually, the World Health Organization is estimating that in the next uh, decades, up until uh, uh, 2050, more than 120 million people are going to suffer from Alzheimer's disease across the globe. So this is uh, making it into a pandemic that is actually even uh, bigger than the COVID pandemic we, we had to endure recently. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not a, a disease that can be cured by you know, a, a, an effective drug yet or uh, by a vaccine. So I think we need to invest more in uh, uh, research in that area, but also in uh, the development of innovative drugs. Uh, otherwise, I think we're going to be exposed to a huge challenge in the future. Okay, Nectari, I would like to also to reverse uh, the question and say, okay, I picked up the key words from each one of you. Okay, are those aging, uh, you know, uh, diseases or are chronic diseases that we have to face as a future? You know, Alzheimer is also a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and uh, let's uh, see the younger generation for chronic diseases on the other side. Mm -hmm. What is well, the, 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 the thing is we don't really uh, understand the molecular basis of Alzheimer's disease yet. There are a, a few hypotheses out there, uh, but we are finding uh, uh, new things uh, constantly that are uh, revising our initial hypothesis. So, uh, there still needs uh, to be uh, done more research in that area. And I think that um, uh, the fact that now uh, the life expectancy of the general population has increased, uh, this is also leading to an increase in the frequency of, uh, of these disorders. In the old times, uh, beginning of the 20th century, actually people would, would not live long enough to suffer. Uh, from such diseases, and uh, uh, but now this is uh, becoming uh, more and more of a burden, and I think that um, it's only going to get bigger in the future. Thank you, Nectaria. Sloan, what do you think? So, Opportunities, challenges today for biotech? We discussed aging, we discussed chronic diseases, I, drugs, yeah. and maybe the, tra <laughs> the trends now in your field, I mean. It, it's, it's, it's kind of a nice intersection for um, to talk a little bit about what we're doing currently at Iterative Health, which is we're focusing on a chronic disease, inflammatory bowel disease, which does impact patients who are young, too old. And it really is, it's a disease where we actually have a little bit more good fortune in terms of being able to understand how it manifests early on. So we are able to, if we are able to approach it from the right perspective, actually help a patient from having the disease progress as, as terribly as it might otherwise, right? And so, so we are fortunate in, in different than the Alzheimer's space in that you are able to have the disease, the disease manifest at the age of you know, 14, 16, 20, 30, 40, and at that point in time, you're able to provide care that can um, truncate its progression. I think it would be very exciting if we get to the point where we can actually predict who is going to manifest those symptoms before they manifest and then, again, prevent them from even having any of the disease um, impact in their life. Ultimately, I think you make some really good points around the fact that we have this aging population where you have many diseases which we haven't really had to tackle at the scale that we've had to tackle them because people haven't lived long enough. <laughs> and it's very challenging to figure out how you might address them earlier. Um, on the other hand, from the public health perspective, I get very excited about the idea of if we can bring, if we can target treatments 
earlier and prevent people from having this progression to begin with, then how much do we save not only the economy, but the individual, their quality of life, et cetera. And so I, I am very excited to see what research brings in the next five to 10 years in terms of how we can help nip these, nip these diseases in the bud earlier on. Thank you, Sloan, for that. I will come back with uh, some questions about the technologies next. Sounds good. Because it's very important. You, Brian, what do you think about uh, this issue of okay, trends now in biotech? Well, the, the trends on sort of aging population in particular, I mean, it sort of reemphasizes the the things that we're doing in sort of the context of Japan. Is Japan as as the is leading the world in some sense in terms of the population inversion, and so it's a it's a whole of government, whole of society sort of uh, questioning. Well, how do they keep the aged in home longer, so as to not overpopulate the hospitals? And what does that mean for the healthcare system? What does that mean for the the mechanisms that need to be in place for caregivers, whether they be family or, and the technologies that are deployed. So it very much speaks, um, you know, Japan is leading the way in many ways of, of trying to figure this out as a society. Um, so I spend a lot of time there and working with companies there that are, that are very much trying to address the technologies and the devices and the sensors that can have some impact in, in doing that. So. Okay. What do you think that is a future in sensors? Um, well, one area that I'm particularly excited by, um, and it may be something that's new to many in the audience, um, you're very familiar with integrated electronics. It's enabling our, our iPads and our phones. Um, the same uh, technology stack, um, largely from the design tools out through the, the fabrication technologies, is enabling something called integrated photonics, uh, which allows the miniaturization of optical systems into the same form factors that we have for our electronic devices. And as a sensing technology, if you think of things like microfluidics and point of care technology that for many years was overhyped, uh, one of the challenges with microfluidics was the, the expensive optics to interrogate and make the, the, the reading. And so now the ability to miniaturize your optical systems and have them be made for the, the same low cost way that our electronics can be, um, potentially allows us to now go back and look at all the things that could have been done more successfully uh, with a much lower cost footprint optical solution. It's allowing us to make uh, a very no interesting number of novel biosensors and, and, and imaging, uh, things like uh, um, uh, ultrasound, uh, things like MR, uh, sort of the things that we can potentially miniaturize with, with a sort of a new platform around photonics, I think as a, as a sensor area is, is very exciting. Okay. What about the new materials that are in the, entering this world, like graphene? Um, so graphene is, as a sensor, there's, there's a lot of work in that space. I think one of the challenges with new materials at scale, and this is certainly also true in the integrated photonic space, is that we're, we're as, a, as a world economy, we're very situated well with silicon. Um, and silicon is not necessarily the right platform for biosensors. So silicon nitride, silicon oxide, sort of uh, gallium sort of mixes. Yeah, we don't have the fabs yet that can handle that at scale. Uh, but that's an area that I think, with certainly in the U.S. with the CHIPS Act, uh, looking at some of the investment uh, that the U.S. is going to be putting into novel packaging and trying to reshore some of the manufacturing of the semiconductor industry is looking at new materials, what are the things that are needed five and ten years down the road, uh, and looking at maybe a little bit differently than just the, the historical infrastructure in, in silicon. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Stelio, what do you think in your area? I mean, from a different, yeah. let's say, a very long experience. Don't remind me very long experience. In other words, you're very yeah. old. Okay. No, no, no. I'm it's okay. Same age. Uh, oh. <laughs> look, I, I think there are two ways to look at, uh, at the world around us. One is to say what it should be. And the other one is to say, let's recognize what it is and what it's likely to be because of what it is. So here's some facts that, and I don't mean to offend, you know, my Greek friends and relatives, people from Europe, but fact is the bulk of the innovation in new drug discovery happens in the U.S. And the next fact is the bulk of the innovation in drug discovery is funded by private capital, not by government subsidies, not by philanthropy. It is investor capital, which has been put into these companies for the expectation to make more money. Therefore, what drives decisions on what to develop has to do with the opportunity to make money selling those drugs. So now we come into this discussion. 
disease of the aging. They're interesting in the sense that, as Nectario said before, there's a demographic that's pointing to people slowly living longer, therefore more likely to have them. Uh, Alzheimer's is an interesting example of great prevalence of the disease, but what is unclear is, even with the newer drugs, whether the treatment be for one year, or two years, or 10 years. That makes a big difference in expected revenues. Uh, chronic diseases, they're not necessarily diseases of the aging. For instance, the vast majority of autoimmune disorders, which are chronic diseases, manifest earlier in life. Sometimes in the teens or 20s, a patient, a typical first-time presentation of a patient with multiple sclerosis would be a female in early 30s and may be on treatment with drugs for 30 years. I know it sounds crude. That's a good business because you keep on treating the same patient time and again. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases, those can manifest themselves at any time, from at birth to in your 30s, and they may last you know, anything from months to years of treatment. So those have you know, their own different attractiveness as opportunities. And of course, to all of those, you superimpose the doability of the problem. Can you solve the problem? We've been struggling for Duchenne muscular dystrophy for a very long time. We have some drugs, not very satisfactory. Uh, many more people are trying to come up with better ideas. Uh, and then, of course, there is huge markets like cardiovascular disease. If only we could anticipate who is likely to have, and very likely, not 60% chance. These are not actionable statistics. If you can tell me that in the next two months, it's like predicting earthquakes. If you tell me the next two months, I have a 95% chance of a heart attack. I may change behavior. <clears throat> I may take some drugs. We don't have the capacity for that. Cancer strikes reasonably early or late. It's complex and it's multiplex. So there's a huge number of opportunities out there. And for better or worse, they're being addressed on the basis of the commercial attractiveness of solving the problem. Okay, uh, Slovan and Stelio, you both spoke about, you know, uh, prevention, about prediction, and maybe to inform and alert the patient. So in this area, they, there are technologies coming like AI, data science, and so on. Sloan, you would like to comment on that, how those technologies are entering biotech now, and what is the future for those? I think there's a, a lot of potential applications, and, I'll, and I'll, let, I'll let Stelia speak more to the actual drug development side of it, but one of the applications that we're currently pursuing is how do we help pharma companies that have developed drugs get those to market faster? Um, a specific use case, again, just to bring back to inflammatory bowel disease, is that you, have a, you may have years of development to get this drug that you believe targets the right, the right, the right, the right, the um, right, pathophysiological pathways to make sure that this patient will not have their disease progress. They will respond to that treatment. And you have to then go through this clinical trial process and to enroll patients, you need to make sure that they meet certain eligibility criteria. It's really important to make sure that you've developed the right protocol to have generalizability while at the same time setting your, your test up for success. Um, one of the challenges is that when you have clinical trial protocols that are that are drafted to the specificity, you may end up having a very challenging time finding the right patients who are eligible for your study, and then making sure that the protocol is pragmatic enough that they want to enroll in it and actually you know, take that risk of trialing out this new drug so that they can potentially respond to it, but also aid in bringing that treatment to market. And so one of the approaches that we have taken is aiding pharmaceutical companies in identifying potentially eligible patients so that they can actually perform these clinical studies in an effective way. Another key um, area that AI can contribute in the inflammatory bowel disease space is in performing a standardized central read. So for the mucosa in a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, the endoscopic mucosa, one of the key assessments of disease progression is whether or not there are certain features that have manifested in that mucosa and whether or not those features have become more severe or less severe over time. And the standardization of that assessment is really key in, in ensuring that one, 
We know that this patient at baseline truly was scored as, for example, a three. And then when they are on this drug for eight weeks, 12 weeks, 22, et cetera, then they're evaluated again. Do they actually show a response? Do they have, have they declined from a three to a two, to a one, to a zero? And if there's inconsistency in the evaluation of that mucosa, then you can set that trial up, unfortunately, for failure because of the variability in how providers are assessing this, this tissue. And so we're also working on bringing standardized AI tools to help ensure that that assessment is consistent, not only within different studies, but really against every single patient who's, who's seen in, in a clinical trial. So those are two ways that AI technology can, post-drug development, help bring those drugs to market more efficaciously. Tell me, what about your thoughts about AI, you know, in drug development, let's say, maybe drug repurposing also, which is a very hot issue today. Yeah, I'll talk about this in a form, but let me for a moment address the prevention issue oh, yeah. and, and, uh, and the implications. It's important to understand that prevention is largely a matter of public policy, health policy. It's not so much science. Look, we all know for many, many years, cigarette smoking is not good for you. Well, it took a lot of effort on the part of the political establishment by countries to enforce laws that would ban smoking, in public places and all public places, public relation campaigns, when your little son says to you, Dad, you're going to die, stop smoking. All these things over the decades have managed to reduce cigarette smoking by a lot. That's not science. That's public policy. And most of prevention, it's about obvious things. Eat well, exercise. These are all good things. Do we do them? I, for one, I never smoke, so it's not a big problem, but... Eating well and exercising, I've not been a champion of that because I'm just weak. I mean, that's just what it amounts to. Uh, prophylaxis is another point. Prophylaxis is quite different from prevention. The classic triumph, that's a scientific triumph, of prophylaxis is statins. You know, since the 1980s, you know, many of us have been taking drugs. They are there to control your cholesterol levels. And this is prophylactic to preventing atherosclerosis, to preventing a heart attack. And a lot of that is going on. It all has to be in the context of a commercial proposition, that the markets have to be big enough, or if they're smaller, the prices to be attractive. And that goes on in the daily decision-making by all executives. On the issue of AI, it's probably the biggest thing we've seen in biomedicine nowadays. And I can speak at, I've spent, I've spent the last five years looking at where in, healthcare, particularly as it relates to drugs, you know, AI is going to have a critical effect and how can one, through an investment proposition, make money out of it? Uh, so the application is everywhere. You can, uh, you can th think of AI in the area of drug discovery, of drug development, of commercialization. Uh, I would say this, most of the propositions about drug discovery are not sufficiently attractive, financially speaking. If you tell me you can accelerate the process by which I can have a so-called development candidate, a molecule that I can start preparing for clinical studies in nine months as opposed to 12 months, three-month gain in a 10, 15, 20-year process doesn't change my life. I'm not going to be crazy about this. But if you tell me you can give me a drug candidate for an otherwise undruggable target, then that's worth a lot to me. Unfortunately, most of the AI and drug discovery is aiming for the former, efficiency, rather than solving otherwise insoluble problems. Um, drug development, it's important to understand better subsets of populations for different drugs so that the efficacy the signal-to-noise ratio will improve, the efficacy will improve, and AI can do that. Uh, I think it's probably going to have more implications and more impact on the commercial side of the business, like what Sloan is talking about. Getting at the, at the user end, at the clinic, improving outcomes, convincing people to do something. But all the algorithms that come to you telling you something about what you have, they've got to have actionable information. If you tell me by doing this, I have 60% greater chance of having a heart attack sometimes in the next 20 years, that's useless. It's not going to change my life. I know that already. <laughs> However, 
Here's another combination of health and something else, health and vanity. There's a new class of drugs called GLP receptor, GLP-1 receptor agonists. You may have seen the advertisements on Ozempic and Monjaro and all of these. Now, these are initially drugs that treat type 2 diabetes, and they do a good job of it. But on top of it, they help you reduce weight. So now you combine vanity with good health, a drug that's efficacious, and it's acceptable in terms of side effect profile, that's success. Thank you, Stelio. Brian, okay, you're collecting data from your sensors. What are you doing with the data? That's AI, big data, cloud? So yes, yes, and, and, and yes. Uh, yeah, I think, but I think those are maybe sort of the, the obvious sort of answers to how you, one of the ways that you, another piece of the enabling pipeline that you need to make use of the proliferation of sensors. I think another area that we've not touched on too much um, is in the imaging space, yeah, and specifically whether it be ultrasound or MR or CT, but helping, you know, maybe focusing a little bit on the ultrasound side where we've done a lot of work. How do you put a, a imaging modality that's fundamentally safe, non-ionizing, but really difficult to interpret, really difficult to get uh, repeatable imagery so you can track longitudinally? So there's a lot of work that we've done and others have done to um, add machine learning intelligence to help the, the non-radiologist, the general practitioner, first figure out how to acquire a good diagnostically relevant image, um, and then how to also guide them to be able to, to acquire that imagery longitudinally, you know, to get back to the same orientation and position to track a tumor or some aspect of the body. So I think that's an area where it's the intelligence that's helping to make the, the clinician a little bit better, to help to make the radiologist a little bit faster, uh, to help make the, the general practitioner uh, sufficient enough to be able to use an imaging modality that they're a little bit um, sort of not, not afraid of, but they can't be, they're not as efficient as they would be if they sent that same patient to be imaged by a, a trained sonographer. Um, so I think that's an area, you know, the, the machine learning to uh, help interpret imagery, to help acquire imagery, and to accelerate the use of imagery in, in the general practice. Yeah, thank you. Natari, what do you think about AI in your area? You're producing a lot of data, okay? Well, AI has been transformative in basic uh, research, basic biological research. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know very recently, AI help, helped uh, solve the structure of uh, thousands and thousands of proteins. This is actually, I think, is going to lead to uh, new druggable uh, uh, targets and uh, pathways, uh, because that's what uh, was missing, uh, having the structure of, of, of proteins, and this was a bottleneck in the process. So AI is already contributing uh, to transform, to completely transform this, uh, this area of research. Uh, but I think that now that we also have uh, the, the capacity to uh, sequence in large scale individuals, uh, we can go and collect data from large populations. These are pro uh, procedures and uh, approaches that we couldn't imagine a few years back. Now we can analyze the data using AI and then come up with conclusions that will, I think, uh, eventually influence the clinical practice. And I think uh, I'm optimistic that we will also have information that will uh, 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 be capitalized by uh, uh, companies that need to be uh, need need to develop uh, new druggable uh, uh, pathways and, tar and targets. So uh, indeed AI is, I think, is, is, is a great facilitator. And um, what I'm seeing is that it, it will become more and more an integral part of uh, basic research approaches. Okay. We discussed about AI, we discussed about a little bit about new materials. Okay. What are other technologies which okay, are coming now to the health, okay, to the biotech? Amazing technologies. What else? Really good question. Does anyone have a good answer? Well, I would like to ask the so the, the, the our pharma representative here. So on on sort of the combined sort of you know, device and pharma together. You know, I have a particular experience on the device side, but love to see the perspective on you know, where where that intersection really potentially valuably sits. Well, I'll answer both. Uh, what's the big thing coming up in biotech and? issue of devices. Look, the device interface has not been as prevalent perhaps as the device people would like it. Probably, you know, the uh, 
the biggest thing in the last 30 years, if you ask me, was coated stents, where you took a stent to go and enlarge the blood vessel and keep it open and put a drug on it, you know, to make that more, more effective. Uh, I think devices, and in particular sensors, are extremely valuable, but not necessarily to have drugs with them in, in combination. So I'm, I'm not seeing a huge amount of synergy there. Now, in terms of what's coming down the line, probably the, the uh, well, one, one quick thing. What Nectarius was describing for about AI, he said something very meaningful. AI will become part of our daily language, part of our daily practice in dealing with biological data. Not unlike the way, you know, back in, I was still a graduate student, you know, we had the first, you know, DNA sequencer and the first, you know, oligonucleotide synthesizer, and all of a sudden, our world changed in how we could do things, and then we sequenced the genome, and it just became another part of our vocabulary. So AI is there everywhere now, for sure. But the big things that everybody's talking about is uh, gene therapy, gene modification, CRISPR, and all those things. And that's generating a lot of excitement. I will give you a counterintuitive view. I'm not excited. I'm not excited because I think one more time, we're rushing to the clinic a little bit too soon with these gene modification approaches. By and large, most of these, including the famous CRISPR that everybody has learned to pronounce, uh, what we're really doing is we're doing molecular surgery. We're going in, we send some vehicle, and that is to go find a target in the DNA, the genome of, of the patient, Go in there, clip, add, subtract, change, and do that only where it should do and no place else. And I just don't think we have enough scientific backing to be absolutely certain this is safe. And already there have been now a number of instances during clinical trials that people develop malignancies or other complications because of off-target effects of these gene constructs. Now, if there's a disease which is otherwise fatal, in a short term, and there's no alternative, obviously, you know, I would consider, you know, gene therapy that seems to be promising for that. But if gene therapy is to be introduced in the treatment of a condition because it's more comfortable, because it's user-friendly, uh, there's this concept being advertised called one and done. Take, for example, a hemophilia patient. Hemophilia patient would either have, you know, injections of certain proteins as needed or on a regular basis, every day or once a week, depending on, on, on the drug that you, give, that you give. And he said, well, look, you can forget all of that by having one treatment with gene therapy and get done. If I were hemophiliac, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't take the risk that I may develop cancer or some other unknown complication just because it's more convenient than injecting once a week. So this, this is, I think, a growing debate. We had a major setback. Gene therapy started back in the 80s. You know, there were the famous skid babies, severe combined immune deficiency, the bubble boy, and they were treated, you know, in a gene therapy protocol that didn't go very far. And then in the late 90s, there was an acute death of a young man at the age of 18, 19 at the University of Pennsylvania in the context of a clinical trial in gene therapy, and that set the the field back by a number of years. So we got to be careful. Adjacent to gene therapy, I would say I'm far more excited about cellular therapies. Either cells that are unmodified, but we believe will do some good, but most of them modified appropriately to be effective. And we see this when you hear about CAR T cells. These essentially modified cells in the context of cell therapy, in this particular case, in cancer. The beauty, the intellectual appeal to me about cell therapy is that you give it, it does what it does, and at some point washes out and doesn't leave a memory behind, doesn't change anything permanently. And there I'm prepared to operate with less complete knowledge than a permanent change in the genome. Okay, we have many young people in our audience, and I would like to hear from you what do you suggest for them if they'd like to start a new company? Nectari, you have fourth. <laughs> you are the director of fourth. Okay. What do you suggest to all those researchers that we have there? Well, 
I can say that they should have patience and perseverance, <laughs> especially here in Greece. <laughs> it's a complicated process in itself. It's becoming uh, simpler, uh, but we are not there yet. We are not uh, at the level of the US, for example. Uh, there are also the practical issues that might have to do with intellectual rights and uh, how you handle those. Uh, I think that uh, if, you, if you believe in your results, if you really believe in your idea, then if you uh, have patience and uh, you really push, uh, eventually you will make it. You will have a successful uh, company here in Greece even. And this is, uh, I think, demonstrated by the many cases where uh, companies that started in Greece uh, became big, they, were, they, they, they became scale-ups, and then eventually uh, they, they had a very successful exit. So uh, it can be done in principle. I don't think that it's uh, easy. So that is why I think you need a lot of patience and, and, uh, and you really need to believe in your uh, findings, in your ideas. Sloan, you are already there. Um, but okay, time is changing. You might need to change your product. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think I would just echo what Natario said in terms of you've got to be per, you have a lot of perseverance. You've also have a lot of passion about the problem you're trying to solve. And so, so like you said, you know, you may be really excited about one approach, but you need to be willing to adapt that approach if it turns out that there is something you've learned along the way, right? Um, objectively, entrepreneurship is about learning as much as it is about about bringing something to market, about being successful. You can't do that if you aren't willing to check your assumptions. Speak to experts who have information you don't have and constantly make sure that you are nimble enough to respond to that new information. I think so. It's just being as passionate about the problem you're solving as it is about the approach that you think is interesting. Stelio, any advice to those young people who have hmm. only a couple of seconds? Well, here's a simple word. It's important to dream, but do so with your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs>